C is for conflict. Hi, I'm Beck from Be Free Emotional Fitness Training, and I support women and girls to become emotionally stronger. And I'm Vern from Move Forward Mentoring, and I specialize in male mentoring, helping boys and men find their passion, speak from their heart, and build better relationships. And together we are Rekindling Relationships. We work with couples through mentoring sessions, as well as facilitating communication and creative workshops to build deeper connections. Welcome to our podcast designed to help you strengthen and bring more fun into your partnership, as well as create a more loving, healthy and strong connection. So today we're talking conflict and we're talking about the main areas of conflict, why it happens, the mismatch in values, the behaviours that make this worse and how we can resolve them and move forward. Yeah, and I think it's really good to acknowledge that We all are going to have conflict in our relationship, but how do we make sure that that conflict doesn't ruin the relationship but instead makes it grow? There is healthy conflict and there is unhealthy conflict. Healthy conflict looks constructive, kind that stirs disagreement but doesn't encroach upon another person's basic respect for the other one. It can help your relationship grow, but there's also unhealthy conflict and that looks like, you know, the other person in blaming and asserting their power and it becoming, you know, negative statements and that's a really unhealthy conflict. You know, the main areas of conflict, which are five things that couples generally fight over, are money, sex, work, parenting and housework. These are all stresses that happen to all of us. It's learning how to be able to communicate what we want, how to collaborate together that allows us to deal with them in a healthy way. Yeah, these are actually just everyday occurrences, aren't they? Yeah, and I think that idea, what you said about that constructive conflict, it's not about me being right and you being wrong. Um, That power over, which I think is a lot of conflict. Mm. When we're looking at, okay, how do we work together so that we can move forward in this relationship? How can we make really healthy decisions that we both agree on about money, about sex? Mm about work, when we can have really healthy discussions that allow for conflict, that allow for disagreement, when we hear conflict, we think of a fight, Mm. but we can actually just disagree and then discuss it until we feel like we've been heard. There is a mutual understanding about negotiating. So it's Mm. a negotiation. So there's a mutual understanding of how we're going to move forward with that. Mm. Something like chores is a big one. I think that's probably, I actually think probably that's one of the biggest ones that I hear people talk about. Yeah, tell me about that. You know, quite often one person will feel that's really imbalanced so that one will feel they're doing way more than the other person. And so then that creates conflict yeah. because because there hasn't been a negotiation, there's been no discussion, healthy discussion about it. Because quite often it's become an issue in your head way before it becomes a blow up. So I think it's really good. If it's starting to niggle at you, no problem is too small to discuss. If it's starting to piss you off. <laughs> then do something about it, yeah. <laughs> then chat, yeah, don't, don't talk don't just, about don't just it. Don't have it all going in your head. No, because, you know, don't let it become the 10th time that you've had to do the dishes and you're really cheesed off and then it ends up being this big blow up. Partner does not know what's going on in your head. No. And if they don't get told, then nothing changes. And maybe you've said it over and over again. Mm. and nothing's changed, then that means it's time to actually sit down and discuss it, to have Mm. a healthy conversation about those chores, that housework. Like how do we – it doesn't have to be divided equally down the middle. It has to speak to each other's strengths and there's a negotiation, like you said before. Mm. I think it's really being mindful too of when when you have those discussions, not to say things like, you never do the dishes, you know, because that's instantly going to get the back up. But, you know, sometimes it's the way we approach the discussion that helps not create an unhealthy conflict. For us to actually negotiate these stresses in our life and how we're going to work together, we really have to align our values, don't we? Yeah, I think values is the underlying reason why people have the conflict ends up being a big deal or any of these issues that everyday issues become a conflict because one person values one of these things more than the other let's say sex intimacy Mm -hmm. one person might want to be intimate more often than the other person 
And without a discussion about that, there's no way to come to an agreement of how both parties' needs can be met. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We have something which is called coordination failure, and it's a common problem in marriages. And coordination failure is about these mismatched sex drives. One person, you know, wants to be intimate at certain times and in certain ways. And we're a bit fearful about having a conversation about that because it might be a bit it might be a bit cringy. Oh dear, we're talking about this thing. But how freeing is it to actually have a really open, honest conversation about what you actually want and what you need. And then to really hear your partner and go, oh, that's what you want. Okay. And then come to an agreement in there because then both people win. It's a win-win situation. The problem is with conflict is that we, we think about this win-lose. I have to get what I want and you miss out. Mm. Or I have to let go of what I want so you can get what you want rather than both of us looking towards a win-win. Mm. Then there's no conflict. And quite a lot of these are like intertwined, aren't they? So, you know, if you were like, it's important to sit down with your partner, I would say weekly on a lot of these things, isn't it? And go, okay, how, how do you feel about if any of these are coming up for you as an issue? How do you feel about this, this and this? And she might be like, or he might be like, if we helped out with the chores, then, you know, or we did dinner, then I might feel a bit more like I've got a bit more time for sex you know like you know or I might feel more inclined to you said something about when we first um, moved in together and I insisted on washing up all the dishes every time you cooked Mm. because to me that made sense that's a equal um, division of labor there I'm getting an awesome meal so I'm happy to clean up the kitchen afterwards and that hasn't been your no it hasn't been my past experience all the time that's for sure but I also appreciate that because then I feel like I'm valued because it can build resentment if you feel like you're doing an uneven load of the work. And you said that um, doing the dishes is like foreplay. Yeah, doing the dishes is like foreplay for women. If you do the housework, that's a massive turn on. (laughs) Handy hint for anyone listening out there. (laughs) Do the dishes for it tonight. You might get lucky. (laughs) So let's move on to the behaviours that make this worse. Gottman talks about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which are these toxic behaviours to contribute to couples feeling more disconnected from each other and creating conflict. These are criticism, defence, contempt and stonewalling. Yeah, I think he he says a really interesting point there that too, that if these start to be shown in relationships that the likelihood of divorce is very, very high. First one was criticism. So that includes complaining with blaming or attacking. And that's a really, I think criticism comes up a lot in conflict with couples where they criticise what the other person does. And there's no, there's no way to respond to that, is there? When someone criticises me, I feel like putting my defences up. I don't feel like engaging in that conversation. No, you shut down straight away. It shuts down the conversation instead of opens it up. And then there's defensiveness, obviously taking no responsibility at all yeah, and, and being defensive about your behaviour instead of owning it and saying, oh, yeah, okay, maybe I do need to maybe work on uh, – I will try and do the chores a bit more often. Mm. I'm, I'm hearing you. Yeah. yeah, rather than no, 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 um, it's not my fault. Yeah, or well, you're um, always nagging me. You're all, yeah, you, you always say this and – there's probably a reason why it's always being said. Mm. Um, so it's not coming to the table, is it? It's not coming to the table it's to not actually owning, your not owning it and coming mm. to the table to actually say, yeah, yep, yeah, this is worth talking about. Mm. Contempt is a really interesting one. And I've been in a relationship where I used to get all the eye rolling, body language, which I would see it and I'd just be like, oh, it actually made me feel a bit cringy inside because, like, oh, it hurts. It's like a little stab, you know? It's like a little, it, they, did the, they didn't have to say anything. It was the looks and the, and the facial expressions, this devaluing of me as a person. And with that contempt, it's that, it's that power over. So one partner acting superior, so they're being disrespectful. They're saying, well, I'm, I'm actually more important than you, so I can be annoyed with you or you know, act like you're useless or not worthy or whatever. Mm. And then there's stonewalling. You hate stonewalling, oh, don't I you? Actually, I actually, it's one of my agile pet hates. <laughs> Pet peeves so bad. It's come up a few times for oh, us. Oh, so I get so <laughs> mad. 
I, I feel like it's like a real childish thing to do, though, too. I think as soon as you stonewall, you actually have nowhere to go. You can't resolve anything. It's obvious that they become silent and don't want to engage in the conversation at all. And you can't actually go anywhere with that. I feel like that happens where the other things have happened first. So the the criticism and the defensiveness and the contempt has led to the point where all of a sudden people are just withdrawing from each other and stonewalling. They're just like, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. It's, it's not worth it. It's too hard. As well as it being a way of avoiding conflict. So I'm not dealing with the issue. I'll just be quiet and maybe you'll go away. Yeah, which never works. No, I've tried it. It doesn't work. <laughs> I've never tried it. <laughs> and with this, you know, what happens is in a relationship is when these things are part of it and there's, it's, there's no healthy conversation, there's just conflict, partners, each person in there starts feeling lonelier and more isolated. There's a disconnection. Mm, I, I think that with stonewalling particularly, I think that I've ever felt that and it's probably one of the things I hate about it too is that you have – the other person has this instant feeling of feeling unsafe and disconnected. Like, where do I go? You're not even talking to me anymore. There's a whole insecurity that comes with that that's nasty. Yeah, Yeah, and that insecurity is part of... You're not the, working uh, together anymore. Yeah, that insecurity brings up attachment, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it all goes back to that attachment style, doesn't it? So now that we've spoken about what causes conflict... And um, the behaviours around that, how do we resolve conflict? I mean, there's many ways and I I think one particular way is to be direct in resolving it. So, you know, sometimes we can be a little bit skirt around the edges and be a bit passive aggressive but not actually say what's bothering us. So I think being direct is always a good one. Why do you think people are indirect when they speak about things that are bothering them? I think it's not to hurt the other person, but also you. I think there's a part of you that doesn't want to create conflict, so you think that by saying it straight, it's going to cause problems, whereas I think being passive-aggressive and indirect, that's not helpful at all. And with the directness, I think it's being careful to not blame. So you're doing this and you're doing that. It's more like this is making me feel like this something that's coming up for me and bothering me so sometimes it's the way obviously it's the way it's put across to makes a big difference which is what we touched on before I noticed with us you can tell if there's something that's pissing me off even before I say it oh yeah (laughs) I can see exactly what's going on in that face (laughs) but I think it's sometimes not always the right time I find to talk about it found it helpful that sometimes I'll be like okay And it's something I'm still working on in honesty. But, you know, to say, okay, it's this, but it's probably not the right time to talk about it now. So don't worry, you know, so you don't come up with it as some other, you left in the lurch not knowing what it is. But I still, I still prefer if you say to me, it's about this, let's talk later on when we have more time. So I'm not making something up in my head because otherwise, if you've got something going on and I have no idea, then I'm more likely to brood on it. That gets me really anxious and really edgy. But if you just say this thing about the kids or this thing that happened with this, then I know, oh, okay, that's what it is. And then I can let it go or Mm. I can even think about it. So I've got something to talk about as well. It sort of allows me to come to the table with some understanding and some ideas of what we're going to talk about. That's a really good thing for men to have. I think we sometimes do not have the emotional vocabulary to get in and work out what we're feeling straight away. And we're given a bit of time, then that allows us to really sit with it and then be able to speak with more conviction. I think another point is, and it sounds simple, but it's something to be mindful of, is to always listen without interrupting which is also something i'm working on (laughs) (laughs) how do you do that (laughs) and not getting defensive so listening without being defensive and just listening to their side of the story yeah and that's really active listening isn't it it's not just sitting there and 
the words are coming into your ear and nothing's happening. It's mm. it's listening and, and showing the other person you're listening as well. I think that's a really key communication skill is to be able to listen, mm. to, to show you're listening and to show you're listening. It's not just nodding your head at them and saying, hmm, it's maybe paraphrasing what they're saying so that once they say it, you say, oh, you feel like this because of this. And that shows them that you're listening, but it also means that you're really taking on board what is being said. Yeah. Have you got anything else that you feel is helpful? You mentioned it earlier on, which is about that never saying never or never saying always. When someone says, oh, you never do this thing, when there's a disagreement and someone says, hey, you never do this thing, it's going to put our back up because we're going to be able to find a reason where we did do the thing. That's right, yeah. And it also puts us on the defensive. Mm. And even if we don't want to be defensive, it puts you on the defensive because it's, it's a form of attack. There's no, there's no comeback to you never do this except I do do that. Mm. Where do you go with it? Maybe a better way would be to say, I feel like this when you do this. So then you're owning how you feel. Yeah, that's right. And the other person knows how you feel, which... Like you said, we're not mind readers. We don't always know how it makes the other person feel. You know, talk a bit more about listening. I think it's really important to try and get the other person's perspective on the matter. Try and put yourself in their shoes. Sort of perspective taking. Mm. So rather than they're saying this to me, there's a reason why they're saying this. Why is that? Why? How are they feeling right now? What's going on for them? And that will... The emotion that that will bring out more is more empathy and understanding rather than anger and frustration. Yeah, Yeah, there's more compassion if you can get where somebody else is coming from. Yeah, absolutely. And we want to be more empathetic and compassionate towards our partner because Mm. they're choosing us. They're choosing us to be with every day. Mm. Absolutely. That's a nice point. I like that one. Mm. And relationships don't end if you can make conflict make your relationship stronger rather than break it yeah relationship is a partnership so you might not have even made a formal commitment but if you want that relationship to last and you've got to work together on how to manage when you have a difference of opinion because we're different people and we are going to disagree that's the nature of people learning how to do this constructively and working on a compromise or collaboration key part of actually having a successful relationship yeah and i I think again and this might have been mentioned a little bit in the last podcast again you're teaching your kids how to have conflict in a healthy way when they enter into relationships so we've been talking about conflict and the main areas why we do it, the behaviours that make this worse, like the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and how we can resolve it through communication and collaboration. So thanks so much for listening and tune in for our next episode. D is for distractions. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe and follow us. And check out our website at rekindlingrelationships.com. Bye for now. See ya.